Um, hello, everyone, and to everyone online. Uh, I know a lot of people that are, are watching online today. Thank you so much for the uh, for the invitation uh, to the Insolvency Service. Thank you very much. I was uh, well. I was surprised to to receive an invitation in the first place. Uh, but then when I said, yes, I'll come, of course, I was punished to the full and said, well, can you chair a session? Okay, I can do that. Ha knowing Stephen, and, and, and uh, it's a pleasure. So thank you, Laura, for, for the invitation. And I appreciate being here. I haven't been, and I hope it doesn't show too much, I haven't been out of the house for about two years now. Um, and when they said dress is smart casual, I wondered if that was just new pyjamas or perhaps just the existing ones. And I thought, no, no jacket. But then I regretted that as soon as I came in. I remember, I'm in the UK, right? Uh, smart casual means you don't have to dress in a tuxedo or top and tail. So I apologize for not having a jacket. And then, of course, I ripped a tie out. And I see we have very similar ties on, Stephen. And so I didn't do that on purpose. OK. okay. Right, so uh, by way of introduction, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Burdett. I'm a former South African. I've been living here for about 14 years. I spent 20 years in academia and 13 years with the regulator in South Africa, the master of the high court. And I've been, now been with Insol International for about five years. Of course, my, my description of senior technical research officer does cause me some distress because I see on LinkedIn I get searched mainly by IT firms uh, looking for someone and of course my IT skills I'm nearly 60 years old they are non-existent so uh, that's quite interesting right but I've, I have some experience uh, in insolvency and I was just down the road in Nottingham at Nottingham Trent University for nine years right I, I really want to congratulate the, in, the insolvency service on having an initiative like this uh, in South Africa when I worked there we had a lot of collaboration between practitioners and academics and we would get the bench involved from time to time. They, I can say this, and I hope it doesn't offend anyone, but the bench in South Africa, judges do not like change, all right? They did not want any change to come in. They liked things the way they were. Don't mess with it. We know what we do, all right? But it was great to have that atmosphere, that those four, you know, to, to discuss things. And it's great that that's happening here now. The insolvency service, I hope that this will continue for many years to come and be on the annual program for conferences. This is an, these are really important initiatives. <clears throat> and another point I just want to make, bearing in mind Stephen's paper, and I will introduce him in a second. Um, you know, you have a very sophisticated system. If you can start having papers on very technical aspects of insolvency. I did a lot of law reform, and Pete, sitting here as well, did some of this law reform in Africa with me. And the thing about Africa is that a lot of their well, their laws are based on on the UK laws or whatever you know country they were a colony of. So it could be Portuguese, it could be Spanish, or whatever. But those laws were put in place many years ago, and they're still there. They haven't replaced them, and if they do replace them, they like to say, "Well, can we just have? Can we just get up to date with what the UK has? We quite like the UK system." Now you think to yourself, I remember the first one I did. I said, "This is your opportunity to break free from your." from your colonial shackles. Let's, let's design a new law. No, we like the British law, thank you very much. Can you just update it for us? Oh, that's fine. Um, but then you get people say, well, we, we've taken the ad administration and we've bunged it into our law. OK, that's a nice idea. Just as it is, yeah, just as it is. We like it as it is. I said, you do realize that supporting that law is a, a complete labyrinth of, of rules which you don't have. Oh, okay, that's a problem. Uh, and that, of course, is a completely separate discussion about trans, you know, just importing a law without thinking about the context you're doing it in. But the point really is that if you're at a point where you are having technical papers on procedural issues, then you're in a good place. And I think that is why the UK has one of the most successful uh, insolvency systems. All right, I, we could debate that statement at length, but uh, because people do like to copy it. But certainly, reviewing the law regularly is a very good thing. And I'm very pleased now to introduce the speaker for this session. And I've known Stephen for a number of years. Um, Stephen is one of those people that is not scared to come and say his say. And what I like about it, it's always with brutal honesty. And I've read Stephen's paper, 
And his colleagues obviously know him very well because he felt free to criticise them quite openly and robustly, if I may say so. Um, I'm just going to read very quickly the four lines. I don't know how they condensed your CV into four lines, Stephen. I really do not. All right, but they did. A former solicitor, now Stephen has more than 30 years' experience in insolvency law. Uh, is formerly a registrar in bankruptcy and chief bank bankruptcy registrar for a very long time, from 2004 to 2017 when he retired. At present, uh, Stephen is deputy ICC judge of the High Court and also contributor to a wide, wide range of technical legal publications, including over 50 articles on insolvency law procedure. That does not surprise me at all. Stephen, the floor is yours. David, thank you very much indeed for picking up the short straw and agreeing to um, chair this session, um, which is a little unusual compared to the um, high-octane stuff that we've been hearing from so many people so far. Uh, let me just begin with a quote. It may be objected that procedure is not a good theme for academic discussion. Substantive law should come first, adjective law, procedural law afterwards. The former may perhaps be studied in a university, the latter must be studied in chambers. Now that quotes from the opening paragraph of F.W. Maitland's The Forms of Action at Common Law, a series of lectures he gave as Downing Professor of Law at Cambridge, published in 1909, shortly uh, after his uh, death, and uh, a book that was inflicted, I think, on many generations of undergraduates who were studying law. Um, his theme was that in the 19th century, the old forms of uh, legal action had to be overcome because of procedural deficiencies by means of legal fictions. But in spite of that, as he put it, um, the old forms of action continued to rule us from the grave. Now, I'm not going to talk about a form of action that rules us from the grave. I'm going to talk about an arcane procedural anomaly that's written that rules practitioners very much uh, in the here and now, and I'm raising it with the unashamed objective uh, of trying to persuade the insolvency service to make a rule change that will get over it. Uh, and I'll come back uh, to that in a moment. So my, my theme is about forms. Um, I was going to wave a piece of paper like somebody else once waved a piece of paper. Um, but, of course, I now realise that forms don't exist in paper form, uh, at least not according to the current master of the roles. Um, let me um, thank you, David, for um, introducing the only humour virtually on the subject of, um, uh, of, of, of this sort of rather nerdy rule-based stuff. Um, and let, let me move on to uh, what the point of this talk is about. Um, it's really about when you can use a, 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 an insolvency application and when you must use a claim form. And the spotlight was turned on this issue last year as a result of a decision in a case called Reith Taunton logs in liquidation. Um, the substantive application um, was one brought by office holders seeking, in essence, money due from some respondents arising out of the share acquisitions in a company that was in liquidation. Uh, and the respondents, the directors, whoever uh, ever they were, applied to strike the proceedings out on the footing that they'd been brought uh, in the wrong form. And the question before His Honour Judge Corson QC, sitting as a High Court judge, was whether given the nature of the claim, essentially a contractual claim in debt, the office holders had been entitled to bring insolvency proceedings or whether they have ought, to, ought to have started their proceedings by a Part 7 claim form. Uh, he found that the office holders had used the insolvency proceedings in circumstances in which they'd not been entitled to do so. He didn't strike the claim out, um, uh, as he was being asked to do, um, since the defect he held was curable under CPR Part 3.10, not, of course, Rule 1. Point, sorry, 12.64, because they weren't insolvency proceedings, uh, and the proceedings went ahead uh, in the new form. Now, a bit of a fuss about nothing, you might think, until... Um, somebody opportunistically followed up that decision uh, in a case called Manalay Partners PLC versus Hayward and Barrett Holdings Limited and others, which now represents the definitive word on the manner in which certain kinds of proceedings relating to an insolvency 
uh, must be brought and represents something of a procedural setback for practitioners. Now, I'll declare that one of the jobs I have is working for Manalay, so there might be a, perceived to be a conflict of interest there. Um, but I'm going to say something about the result of that case a bit later. And I'm also going to say I'm not speaking as a disgruntled member of Manalay. This is a point of, of very, very general interest to practitioners. It's not just a grouse about the uh, outcome of the individual case. Now, the facts of the case were very simple. Um, the applicant, Manalay, a litigation funder as assignee of various claims arising out of the liquidation of a company called Blackwater, issued proceedings using an insolvency application as provided by Rule um, 1.35 of the new insolvency rules. Um, it included claims under various provisions of the Insolvency Act, but also claims for relief arising out of allegations of misfeasance. The third and fourth respondents, having an eye on Taunton Logs, took the point that a claim in misfeasance made by anyone other than an office holder using the Section 212 route had to be brought by a claim form. And they tried to get an unless order requiring um, the applicant, Manalay, to pay the additional issue fee that would have been payable had the claim form had, had the claim been commenced by a Part 7 claim. Now, at 20 minutes slot, because um, I'm really not going to take very long over this very low-octane point, um, uh, prevents me from going through, I think, all that um, Chief ICC uh, Judge Briggs said, uh, because the short answer is he agreed with that submission that um, Taunton Logs really had to be followed uh, and that because the claim or application or whatever we now call it included this claim for misfeasance, uh, effectively Section 212 was only available to an office holder, an assignee couldn't use it uh, as a procedural route. So he, he, he didn't strike anything out or make any unless order beyond requiring the 10,000 quid for a claim form to be stumped up uh, within seven days, uh, which uh, was duly done. Uh, now, the reason I'm not terribly narked about that, I'll tell you, is that we always said we'd pay the £10,000 fee. Um, and the result of that was that not only did the uh, recalcitrant respondents shine a light where many of us hoped it would never be shone too closely, but they ended up paying most of the costs of that. So it was a huge Pyrrhic victory from which we emerged at least relatively financially unscathed. Um, now, that result, I think, from uh, Chief ICC Judge Briggs was unsurprising, perhaps, in the light of the Taunton Logs decision. Um, but he himself was very troubled by it, and this bit I am going to read out. He said in paragraph 60 of his judgment, I reach these conclusions with regret. The criticisms of the procedure are well made by Mr. Curl, that was counsel for the... He was counsel for the assignee. They do not promote a convenient or sensible or economic use of court resource. In modern parlance, the result fails to ensure that claims of this nature are dealt with expeditiously, allotting an appropriate share of the court's resources, and so on. So he was tying it very much to an element of personal disappointment and the overriding objective uh, under CPR um, uh, Part 1. In fact, <coughs> I would say he was entitled to come to a different conclusion, and I'm going to set out a number of reasons why I say that, and I'm going to argue against myself uh, and allow you to argue against me as well. Uh, either way, my principal criticism of his uh, judgment was a rejection of a submission uh, that um, Joe Curl made on our behalf um, that... Um, the use of applications in the circumstances in which we were using them uh, was established practice. Because I know damn well from my own experience that insolvency practitioners have been using application notices for years, not abusively, but for ins proper insolvency claims, but as it were, tagging on extra claims in debt or misfeasance or what have you, uh, without anybody actually batting an eyelid about it. And I know that from sitting myself. Um, and I'd be surprised if ICC Judge Briggs didn't know that, because he was at the insolvency bar for quite a few years. Um, and it can't have escaped his notice that this 
uh, practice uh, was being uh, adopted. Now, I make good that point also by reference to some cases where it's popped up, although I accept rather incidentally. Um, let me begin with a judgment of his honour, Judge Norris QC, as he then was, long time ago, uh, in a case called Re-Prestige Grindings Limited, where sitting as a High Court judge, he rejected a submission that HMRC could not be joined to proceedings brought by originating application, but had to issue a Part 7 claim. He said, I reject those submissions, with, which I regard as wholly technical, not conducive to attainment of the overriding objective to deal with the case justly, expeditiously and fairly, while saving expense and allotting to it an appropriate share of court's resources. I'm going to take two other random cases I happen to have picked up as well. Obviously, I've chosen them because they support what I'm going to say. <laughs> there may be others around that say something different, but I'd be rather surprised. Um, one, one was a case called Global Corporate Limited versus Hale, uh, which was a hybrid claim. That expression is being used not in the traditional bankruptcy sense at the moment for these things where you bring a an insolvency claim with a misfeasance or something, and that's the sense I'm using it at uh, in this paper. And it was a claim decided by his honour Judge, Judge Matthews, and the judgment is absolutely replete with reference to the application rather than a claim form. Um, now, the reason I've picked on this one is his honour Judge Matthews, before he went down to Bristol, um, held a number of jobs. He was a coroner. And he was also, for a few years, a chancery master. So you might think he'd be a chap who's a bit alive to procedural questions. But no, nope, not an eyelid batted about this hybrid claim and nothing raised by the um, respondents either. And more recently, uh, ICC Judge Burton gave judgment in a case called Bass and Others versus Buchanan, another hybrid claim. I'm not going to go into the facts because that's not the point I'm trying to make nor am I going to read out the bit of the judgment um, that I've got here, um, uh, except to note one sentence where she says it's, been, it's largely been common practice to issue all insolvency claims using the procedure set out in the insolvency rules instead of a Part 7 claim form. So she was alert to the issue, uh, even if it wasn't necessarily an issue she had to decide. <coughs> so that's my first grouse with Chief ICC. Judge Briggs, who is incidentally my boss, because I'm now a humble deputy. I will also say, though, actually, he, was, he very kindly read a copy of this, a draft of this paper beforehand, so there's absolutely no animus between us about any of this. doesn't mean he agrees with me, but that's a different matter. <laughs> my second criticism of, of his judgment is that he ignored a lot of old case law. Um, uh, and I, I'm going to just look at some cases from the 80s, pre-CPR. Um, there's a case that's often still trawled up for all sorts of propositions. It's called In Re Shalina Hosiery Limited. And that was a case brought by Summons, the predecessor of the application. We used to have originating an ordinary summons, and I'm old enough to remember them, just as I'm old enough to remember receiving orders, Peter. Um, going back to your talk uh, this morning. And a preliminary point was taken against the liquidator who chucked in a claim in his summons uh, for relief under Section 172 of the Law of Property Act 1925, a preliminary point was taken um, that there was no jurisdiction to use uh, to grant relief based on an application. Um, and Mr Justice Brightman rejected that point on the basis that it was a claim arising in consequence of the winding up, uh, and I quote him there, and he thought that if a claim arose as a consequence of the winding up, it was perfectly proper. Um, to bung it into a summons. Um, uh, that case was in turn approved by the Court of Appeal in a case called Fabric Sales Limited versus Eratex, and a similar approach was later taken in a case called Reclasper Group Services Limited, in which uh, a liquidator sought relief under Section 239.212 of Insolvency Act by uh, an insolvency application, then applied to amend uh, his application to include a claim for relief against one of the respondents as a constructive trustee seeking to uh, trace the claim into a loan that had been made. And Mr Justice Warner again rejected a suggestion that he should not entertain the Non-Insolvency Act claim 
in the way he was being invited to do. And again, I've, I've got the quote here. If anybody really wants to read all this later, rather than sit here and listen to me read it out, they're, they're very welcome to do so. Um, now, it's perplexing, I suggest, and odd to think, that after the passing of the CPR, that was supposed to make everything so much cheaper and easier, and that's worked well, hasn't it? And after the coming into force of the Insolvency Rules 2016, we should actually be in a worse procedural position <laughs> than we were back in the 80s, when you might have thought judges were a bit crustier than they're supposed to be now. Um, it simply can't have been the intention, I suggest, of anyone involved in the drafting of the CPR or in the drafting of the Insolvency Rules to have created a complexity. And I'll come in a moment to what the complexity is and why I think this is important, because so far this is all quite humorous and a bit of a walk down memory lane, but there are some serious points uh, on the back of this. There's a further existing uh, established uh, practice uh, as well that I draw attention to by way of analogy. Um, and, and this escaped me until recently. It certainly escaped me when I was talking to people about going into court on the Manalay case. Um, there is a particular recognised precedent for dispensing with a claim form uh, in circumstances uh, where it should be used otherwise and where, where non-insolvency relief is being sought uh, in connection with an insolvency. Where a winding up order is sought in respect of a company that's been dissolved, it's common uh, to seek in the petition what is often called a double-barreled order. I can see Riz nodding. He must have, as a junior, had to go down to the winding up court. And a double-barreled order is an order where the company's been dissolved or struck off. You want it wound up. It's usually the revenue doing this. And they say, can you restore it? And then can you wind it up? Um, uh, and it's it's a sort of truncated summary process of achieving that. It's specifically mentioned and sanctioned uh, in the insolvency practice direction. So I, I say, not only have we got this practice, we've got history, we've got a current practice of using a form as a vehicle for doing something for which it wasn't designed. And I wait anxiously now for somebody wanting really to annoy the revenue in the winding up court to say, hello, You've got to go off and issue a claim form to get the company restored first. That will be popular, won't it? <laughs> so I suggest for those reasons um, that, it, that, that there were bases on which uh, Judge Briggs could have um, decided that case uh, the other way. Um, he could have adopted a more pragmatic approach and there were, there, there were foundations for doing so. Though I've got to say in the end... I've got sympathy with him for coming down the way he did because, you know, there he is confronted with a recent High Court case, Taunton Logs, that really makes the matter um, uh, pretty clear. One other thing, I mean, in, in his judgment, he relied very heavily on Rule 1.35. Um, but actually, if you look carefully at Rule 1.35... It doesn't define, I would say, what an insolvency application is. It simply deals with its form and content. There is, in fact, no definition that I've been able to find uh, of what an insolvency application is. And indeed, in the 2016 rules, no definition of insolvency proceedings. I'm, somebody's bound to shout and say, I've missed it all in, in there somewhere. Uh, and if I had, I'd be really grateful because it just would indicate sloppiness on my part, uh, and it's as well that I'd be uh, put right about it. Um, but there we go. Um, that's another reason why I say he gave too much emphasis to a role, the objective of which was not to define what an application was and therefore what it should be. But I accept that Rule 1.35 does contain a very specific reference to the parts of the Insolvency Act to which it applies, and that does not include Companies Act claims, nor does it, unfortunately, include claims under Section 423, transactions to default creditors, itself an oddity, I would suggest, because although it's partly an insolvency and partly a non-insolvency remedy, as we all know, uh, it's, it, it's a curiosity. Now, I tried to think when Manalé was going to court over, um, over this matter, whether there was something in the law of assignment on which I, I have no expertise, and I'll bow to those who do that, you're in some way in it assigning 
a case, you assign the remedies as well. But I've come across authority that says that doesn't work. Um, uh, uh, an, uh, an aside in a judgment of Lord Hoffman in the investors' compensa compensation scheme uh, case that seems to suggest the contrary. Um, so we didn't try that one. There's no point. But people have argued enough duff things on the back of what I've said in the past. There's no point in adding to it. Anyhow, now I come to um, that great question that was once posed by either Lenin or Stalin, what is to be done? Um, and this, I suggest, is actually potentially quite easy. Um, I'm going to throw out general thoughts without being too specific because um, I'm not a great draftsman. If rules are going to have to be changed, um, uh, which is what I'm going to suggest, it would be much better that they were changed with consultation uh, and with a formulation done by somebody who really knows what they're doing. But let me, let me look very broadly at what I think um, uh, could um, be ways of dealing with the problem. Um, and it should be dealt with. Let me begin with section 212, that procedural route to misfeasance. Um, there is no reason, logically, why it shouldn't be extended um, uh, to be available to an assignee. Um, but the trouble is, of course, that's in an act, section 212. It's not in a rule. Um, it's possibly... Uh, the logic for doing it would be this, that you don't actually, as is commonly thought, have to be an insolvency office holder to bring a claim under 212. If you look at the section, it actually refers um, to the ability of a creditor um, or a contributory as well to bring it. So one mischievous suggestion would be if you are an assignee, just take an assignment from a creditor in the liquidation and bring it that way. And in a way, that illustrates the nonsense of the position we're in um, because that's encouraging, I think, a mischievous approach to something that ought to be done uh, in a straightforward way. So anyhow, I'm going to stick away from section 212. I'm also going to stick away from section 212 because I think it goes beyond that. That's a very narrow misfeasance claim. There are others as well, like 423 that I've mentioned, that I really think should be brought within the ambit unambiguously of the application. Um, now, the Insolvency Rules 1986 did contain uh, a definition of insolvency proceedings as any proceedings under the Act of or Rule. But as I've said, I couldn't find a corresponding rule, and even I can look up a, one of those equivalence tables, um, but it doesn't mean I didn't get it wrong. So there's nothing there, I don't think, that we can easily modify, and I accept, of course, it would be difficult to squeeze a non-insolvency remedy into a definition of insolvency proceedings. So I'll forget that one. But it might be a possibility. It might be a way of doing it because there are definitions of insolvency proceedings in a practice direction. And, of course, practice directions have a certain legal force as well. So that might be one avenue of exploration. Um, the other way would be to take... Um, take rule, um, the rule dealing with applications, and remove the reference to parts 1 to 11 and expand it to the whole of the relevant parts of the Insolvency Act. That, again, wouldn't, of course, cover misfeasance or non-insolvency remedies. But why couldn't one expand it to say all parts of the Insolvency Act to include certain remedies under the Companies Act, not everything in the Companies Act, obviously, but those parts of it, such as misfeasance, that are reasonably adjunctive to uh, an insolvency, or even to say that if you bring an application, you should be able to bring within it, along with the tradition of those cases like Shalina Hosiery, anything that's reasonably incidental to or arising out of or in connection. Because the logical absurdity of the position we're in now is supposing you're bringing proceedings for proper insolvency relief, as one might say, misfeasance. You have to bring two sets of proceedings. And there's a debt, say, of, I don't know, 30,000 quid due from one of the directors you have to go off to Northampton and issue through, you know, the whatever thing it is there. I can't remember what it is. 
um, and do it online so that you've got three sets of proceedings going um, in potentially different jurisdictions or different parts of the jurisdiction <coughs> to achieve the same result. Because, of course, if there is 30,000 or 20,000 or 10,000 owing, it's the office holder's job to bring it in for the creditors. Um, whatever happens to it, whether the creditors ever see any of it, he should be bringing it in. And it would be a nonsense to have to have one thing going for Part 7 claim form for the misfeasance, application for the insolvency, and then a separate debt claim. Now, let me just finish by saying why I think this is important. Um, the obvious reason is, well, of course, a claim form costs a shed load of money. Um, uh, and leaving aside arguments about that, um, uh, that is itself, of course, uh, an issue. Um, now, somebody will say on the government side at some stage, well, um, why should HMCTS have to do without that money? Uh, and that's a good argument. The other argument might be, well, now that HMRC is the main creditor in <laughs> so many liquidations, insolvencies and so on, aren't you just... You know, like wearing a corset, the bulge doesn't go away, you just move it around. Um, sorry, that's a terrible analogy. It's probably based on personal experience. Um, that's a nonsense. The alternative argument would be say, well, you just have to pay more to issue an insolvency application. And there'd be a certain logic in that that I couldn't really gainsay, although I'm certainly not advocating that, Mr. Bannister, uh, if you're listening back there. That's not the idea I'm putting forward. Um, because the fee is only part of the mischief. The situation we're now in means that you have to issue your application notice, say in London, before one of the ICC judges. You have to issue your Part 7 claim form before one of the Chancery Masters. And on the face of it, you're in stuck with all the um, disclosure and, you know, case assignment things that have to go on in a mainstream claim, quite unnecessarily. And what the Chancery Masters are doing, I gather now, is saying, all right, you've already issued your application because that's what everyone's doing at the moment, so we'll shove the claim form over to the ICC judge, who will then treat it as if it's an application, case manage, or whatever the expression is, and hear it with the notice of application. What a colossal waste of time and effort that is. And although that's working well in London, I'm not so convinced it'll work quite so well if you've got, say, different courts involved, um, you know, with all the capacity for papers to get lost, and you talk to any practitioner these days, and they will tell you a lot of stories about how things come adrift uh, before between courts when several are involved. So... Um, Bearing in mind what His Honour Judge Norris said uh, in that Prestige Grindings case, what Warner J and Brightman J said back in the 80s, and the considerable regret that uh, Judge Briggs ex uh, expressed for the decision he felt obliged to come to, what I'm going to suggest, and I'm glad there are some people from the Insolvency Service in the room, that you're revising the insolvency rules at the moment. This is, I suggest, and um, I invite better suggestions than those I've been able to make from better brains than mine. I suggest that probably um, the tweaking of the rules to get this into a satisfactory position would in fact be uh, relatively minor. That the benefits were well, certainly minor compared to some of the stuff I'm hearing suggested today, which is quite ambitious. Pretty minor stuff. The benefits in terms of costs, efficiency, and above all, the spirit of what the CPR is supposed to be like are considerable. And I urge you to have a look at this problem and do something about it. And uh, I apologise for that, that uh, being an exceptionally nerdy paper. If there is an award going for the nerdiest paper of the day, that's got to be a, 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 a pretty good contender. Uh, but what I would say, I do emphasise, it is nerdy, but I think it is important to practitioners uh, and quite a number of people I've spoken to support me in that view, even if they don't necessarily support my suggestions. Thanks ever so much for your attention to that. Thank you, Stephen. I'm, I'm pleased to see you're still on top of your, on top of your game. <laughs> top form. <laughs> About um, that. Work. I mean, who could have thought you could work humour into forms? But anyway, that's it. You know, there you go. Questions. Uh, we have 
I think most people have... This is the graveyard shit, Stephen. I think you know this. <laughs> it's where I belong at my age. And it's certainly reflecting on the questions we're having <laughs> online. Um, there are none. Anyone uh, in the room? Yes, Riz. Thank you. So uh, that was very enjoyable. Um, and really, it's a tribute to you that you make this sort of uh, topic so enjoyable to listen to. That's kind of uh, Two uh, observations. One is not quite taking up your challenge to find a definition of insolvency proceedings. I can't think of any in the rules, but I think that the new provision in the, in the Act, which deals with um, the disapplication of the ipso facto clauses, provides a definition, well, it says that for the purposes of this provision, the following constitute insolvency proceedings. And I think I remember that because it, that provision mentions the restructuring plan as, as amongst the insolvency proceedings. And so in Gate Group, that was useful to us. And I believe that it made its way into Mr. Justice Zekaroli's judgment as well. Not sure that that um, goes to your point. Um, I think you make, to, to me, what seems like a very compelling case for, for, this, uh, for this change. The one problem or potential problem in some particular matters may be precisely the rules for disclosure and inspection which, uh, which are present in the Part 7 process, which are present in abbreviated form in Part 8. Um, and it may be that dispensing with them in some situations may be inappropriate if you just have an, uh, a free-for-all in, in, in favor of the, the application route. Uh, I'm not convinced that that's a decisive objection, but that is, that is something to be taken into account, perhaps. No, Riz, can I, can I say something about that? Those points are very well. First, I'm very grateful if, uh, for having my attention drawn to a potential source of uh, definition. I'll, I'll have a look at that. I missed that entirely. Um, secondly, on the disclosure point, I mean, again, it's, it, it's a jolly good point. One of the advantages of the uh, insolvency process is that, particularly at ICC judge level, um, there's a lot of flexibility. So, for example, you often won't get orders for disclosure made at all. In cooperation with the IP, it will very often be said, well, the IP's only got the documents the directors who have been sued have handed over. So I'll tell you what, both of you put them in a room and let them go and look at the documents they provided to which they've no longer got access, which they ought to know in some ways better than the IP. So very often you don't need to go through a disclosure process in the smaller and simpler cases at all. Obviously there are others particularly where misfeasance is involved, where, where, where you may have to. But, of course, there is no reason why an ICC judge, even using the insolvency, um, you know, the slightly truncated insolvency proceedings we use, can't use all the provisions of the CPR um, uh, that come into force. So I think the welcome thing there is, if you're in the claim form thing, you've got to use... At least I think you've got to use pretty much. You've got to go through all this stuff with the, you know, the disclosure protocol, which I barely understand and which is a nightmare from what I gather. Um, whereas your insolvency, you've you've got the two possibilities and, and and possibly an amalgam of the two that ought, with a bit of common sense, to keep the cost down. But it is a good point you make, and I, I take it entirely on board. And it may well be that anything I say uh, would involve a little bit of tweaking of the CPR as well. So it might not be as simple as I say. But look, hey, the CPR changes every week, doesn't it? So what's the problem there? <laughs> More questions? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I was involved in the insolvency rules projects, and I do recall um, a lot of discussion about the definition of proceedings versus insolvency proceedings. And um, whilst it was a good five years ago now, and I can't remember the details, I, what I can reassure you of is that it wasn't an oversight. It was something that we didn't do for a good, very good reason. And I think that is because uh, of, of Section 423, for example, um, and the misfeasance claims. Um, because misfeasance is, um, and uh, my, my question just a sec, misfeasance is also available uh, in administration proceedings. But crucially, it isn't um, available to take action against directors. 
in administration procedures, it's only against the office holder um, and possibly other things, I don't know, but, but not against the directors. That's a, you know, a very big difference between liquidation and administration. Mm. Um, my question to you is, um, if a creditor can, creditor can take a misfeasance action against an office holder in administration, would that still be an insolvency claim? Thinking as I get to my feet. I mean, the, the first thing I'm going to say is that as to any differences between administration or liquidation or indeed anything else that's in primary legislation, nothing I've said could or should interfere with that because, you know, if you can do certain things in administration uh, or not do certain things in administration, you couldn't undo that by a rule change. Uh, and that's certainly not what I'd intend. Um, I, I, I would intend this to be very, very nitty-gritty procedural stuff. Um, I'm interested uh, if the Rules Committee um, uh, did look at this. I, I, I'd be interested to know who was on it at the time. Well, I've I could tell you Judge Zaccaroli was on it. And oh, was uh, he? Well, after Norris, my time in that case, because he was appointed after I left. Um, but I, I'd have to confess I always uh, deferred membership of the Rules Committee to um, others who I thought were probably better than I was at the drafting um, sort of side of things. You know, people who've got, a, frankly, a real chancery brain, which I don't. I'm afraid I'm the sort of guy who's always looking for a shortcut. You really want, when it's drafting legislation, somebody who's got that mind for detail and has the sort of ability to hold the whole scheme of the rules and everything. Nobody ever succeeds, but actually the better the person is, the more likely you are to get a right result. So I, I'll perhaps ask him uh, about that. Um, or indeed, if you've got anything you recollect that you can share. I mean, you, you've got to be careful about this because the proceedings of the Rules Committee are normally private, aren't they? And you, um, you, you don't generally discuss, other than in broad terms, what went on. But I'm interested uh, in that, and I will make further inquiries. But I do emphasise, yeah, nothing I'm proposing would involve, um, I would hope, tinkering with the um, primary uh, legislation. As to whether a creditor, well, I think, I think if the um, section provides for um, 212 to be available, I haven't got my copy of the Act with me, actually. I should have brought my Celia and Millman or my Doyle or, you know, one of those books. But I, my recollection, subject to anybody correcting me, Riz or um, David or anybody, that the liquidator, um, certainly liquidator, creditor and um, contributory, are all lumped together. So uh, my dim recollection would be that the same procedural route would be available to them equally. Uh, I see Riz is nodding, but uh, I don't want to be unfair and lean on him either because he hasn't got a copy of the thing in front of him. And one of the things I always notice whenever you think you know what an act or rule says, you actually read it, it's just ever so slightly different to what you've got in mind. You might be better at that than I am. So I think, I think oddly, yes, that procedure would be available to those other categories of person, which makes it even odder that it wasn't. I suspect this probably wasn't thought about when you know, the assignment policy was um, adopted. And why would it be? Because there was no real problem at the time. We were all shuttling along under the wire, issuing notices of application with everything all bunged into one. I think that's the best I can say on that. Thank you. No, no, thank you for the question. <coughs> Anyone else? Sorry, we were just looking at uh, Cillian Millman on the phone. Oh, yeah. No, 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 thank you. Right oh, it's also legislation. Oh. So, <laughs> are we right? Are you having to wind up for her? Uh, uh, no, no. I, I have a different thing to say. Just to say, yeah. um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I very much support what Riz said about how well you made this come over on such a you know a complex matter. Um, uh, and and to secondly, to say that um, in my long career of doing uh, being in the civil service and doing consultations I've never had before uh, a senior judge send to me his judgment as um, his submission to a call for evidence and say there you go you that's know. what you should do <laughs> this is not a submission that is what you should do 
Oh, do you mean Briggs has done that? Yes. Oh, good for him, yes. <laughs> no, no I'm, I'm delighted with that. Um, yeah. Well, and, there you uh, go. It's not just me, then. I think the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales has sent in something as well, did, did suggesting they? exactly the same oh, change. Oh, OK. <laughs> okay, okay. So, 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 um, Anyhow, sorry so it's, quite, it's quite something for you know, the judiciary to send yeah. uh, to, to us in, in, in policy um, a submission, which uh, we, you know, we, we obviously are taking seriously. Thank you. And yeah. uh, um, I think when we consider uh, all of the responses that we've had to the call for evidence, um, many of those were, were actually a lot more substantive than this one. I think actually yeah. hearing you today, you've made a very, very good case that we'll, we'll consider very strongly. That's the best I can ask for. Thank you, Paul. Right, we, we, if it's a very brief statement, you can do it, but we have to wrap up now. So, are we all right? Talking during the break. Stephen, thank you so much thank uh, you all for doing that. that was, it, it, no. it was really interesting, and I really appreciate that and, and your time and effort coming in. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you all for being here and listening, and uh, thank you. That's it. Thank you.